It's Monday morning, which means we're going over the biggest ranking changes based on this weekend's preseason games. If you subscribe to nothing else throughout the summer, this Monday morning video, which I will be doing continuously throughout the entire regular season as well, I'll be recapping every single game during the NFL season as it relates to fantasy, is worth subscribing for it, and you'll be able to stay on top of pretty much the entire league just based off these videos. So sub if you are new, but we're going to start off with, and I'm fired up about this. I didn't think I would ever hear myself say, and then Tony's going to be equally fired up as he edits this video, that I am fired up about the Denver Broncos offense. Last week, we started off this video talking about how all of the rookie quarterbacks were impressive in week one of the preseason games. And I would go as far as saying they were equally, if not more impressive in Week two, RIP to Minnesota Vikings fans, unfortunately, but Bo Nix and the Denver Broncos offense is where I want to start the preseason two recap with. One thing is abundantly clear that it is the Bo Nix era in Denver. And something I've been echoing all offseason is specifically with the New England Patriots offense. As fantasy players, you have to leave room for things happening on a spectrum. Just because they happened last year does not mean the same exact thing is going to be happening this year. And if we are getting the same prices as last year, expecting the same exact thing, despite massive turnover and massive changes, like we've got in New England with a new coaching staff, with a new quarterback, with new weapons, and in Denver with a new quarterback, a first round pick, et cetera, there is likely room to be had at value here. Do you know how many times people on fantasy Twitter and the draft community have been just flat out wrong on their evaluations of quarterbacks, especially first-round quarterbacks, especially first-round quarterbacks that look and throw the ball like Bo Nix. I would say at like a 65% rate. So if you see everybody coming around a specific player saying that guy's bad, he's probably really good. So I want to preface this by saying that obviously the Green Bay Packers, who the Denver Broncos were playing against last night, uh, did not play any of their starters. So I'm not worried about the production. I'm not worried about like his stats. I'm not here to tell you that Bo Nix was some second coming of you know Peyton Manning or whatever. So his throws look sharp, but he's also this athletic dude that can move a lot. It's very underrated. Like he's a very athletic dude who's going to be very mobile in the pocket. And that excites me, not just because he's going to add like 1.7 or 2.1 fantasy points per game to your stat line, but it's another way that this offense is going to stay on the field and continue to have drives. What gets me most excited about this offense and having Bo Nix maybe be good, right? The reason you've got to leave room for things landing on a spectrum is, is that because if Bo Nix is good, if Bo Nix is even like Gardner Minshew levels of starting quarterback, everybody in this offense is likely going to be a value right now the way that people are drafting Bo Nix or the way that people are drafting Denver is as if Bo Nix is going to be Daniel Jones and there's no way around it that is an absolute fact there's no possible way we could be wrong but based on what we've seen based on what we've heard Bo Nix is going to be at least that and likely more and what that means for this running back room is why I'm ultimately really excited this morning. Uh, predictably, Samaje P. Ryan was playing with the starters on third downs last week, and he was terrible, and it was only a matter of time before Jaleel McLaughlin took that role. Now, Bo Nix played 20 snaps last night. Of the 20 snaps, Jaleel McLaughlin actually out-snapped Javante Williams 11-9. to Javante Williams got the early down work. He was the starter. He played on nine of the 20 snaps. Jaleel McLaughlin came in, ran a lot of routes, all the third and long situations, all the passing down situations. Jaleel McLaughlin came in and played those snaps. With Javante, though, and this is why I'm going to continue to move him up my rankings, Javante is getting all of the early down work. He will be in on almost all of the first and second down packages for Denver, that doesn't mean he's not going to get pass catching work. He was targeted heavily in this when he scored a touchdown on a pass from Bo Nix, which he went over the line of scrimmage and it didn't count. But it's the way this game plan is going to work. Because when we look back at Sean Payton's offenses, don't forget Sean Payton is the head coach here. The percentage of targets that go to running backs in a Sean Payton offense is incredible. I went back and looked at my data since 2013. This chart represents where Sean Payton head coached teams rank in terms of the percentage of their throws or their percentage of their targets that went to the running back position. It went back to 2013. That is a 10 year sample size where a Sean Payton led head coach team has not ranked outside the top five. They are top five in the NFL in the percentage of their throws that go to running backs, including each of the last two seasons last year. And then the last year that he coached in New Orleans, number one in the entire NFL. Jaleel McLaughlin is going to get a lot of targets, but so is Javonta Williams on early downs. Like this is how the offense is built. It is built 
through an extension of the run game through the pass game. Okay. And the reason that this sample size matters so much is because it's a testament to not just, okay, of course they're going to do that when they have Alvin Kamara. Sure. But this is years before Alvin Kamara. This is during Alvin Kamara. This is after Alvin Kamara. This is Sean Payton's offense. And this is why I think Javante and Jaleel McLaughlin are both phenomenal values where they're being drafted right now. As far as a Denver receiving room, we know Cortland Sutton is the one. Tim Patrick, the guy, the fact that this guy still got motion out there on the field after back-to-back years of an ACL tear and then an Achilles tear is quite literally the ninth wonder of the world. But he's the wide receiver too right now in Denver. Okay, so let's move over from Denver to what's probably the second most talked about preseason game of this week was the Kansas City Chiefs and Xavier Worthy. Now, Patrick Mahomes played a lot of snaps in this one. We got two drives. We got a full 18 snaps out of him. And I'll tell you what, the Chiefs, the Chiefs were chief in this one. And y'all know if you've been following me since the dynasty season, I have a pretty much full out fade on Xavier Worthy. Now, since the Hollywood injury, I've moved him up my rankings pretty significantly. Those are always updated in real time in the draft guide right now bdge.co. I also do really, really in-depth game-by-game recaps for all the preseason games as it relates to the biggest fantasy movers in the draft guide as well. bdge.co or sign up on underdogfantasy.com using code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more and you'll get the draft guide access email to you for free. That is the least expensive way to get it. Now with the Chiefs, here's how the receiver room broke up. We got 18 snaps from Patrick Mahomes. Amongst the 18 snaps, Rashi Rice played 17. Justin Watson played 16. Xavier Worthy played 15. Now, everyone's kind of losing their mind over Xavier Worthy's performance. He caught three balls, 62 yards, and a touchdown. I'm about to be, I'm about to get on my Kendrick and be the biggest hater. The first drive of the game, Xavier Worthy caught a 39 yard pass from Mahomes. Xavier Worthy was like a yard offsides. He started his run offsides they didn't call for whatever reason and you could see the defense just stopped they stopped playing defense for a full second and just pointed at him like oh he's offsides if you give a dude who runs a 4 140 a second to start his route before you of course it it's basically a broken play at that point okay so i i get it they're you they're utilizing him a lot they're throwing downfield for sure but to me the xavier worthy game wasn't that impressive when 140 of the 60 yards came on a bullshit broken play and then two the touchdown was from carson wentz so we're not looking at preseason stats from backups that is how you get yourself lost in the sauce and start looking at the wrong things the most impressive thing to me was rashi rice playing 17 of 18 snaps last week i went on a long monologue about rashi rice and why he has now moved on to our must draft players list in the draft guide we have all those for every single position but rashi rice is now up to my wide receiver i think 20 and i think you could argue him all the way up to like 17 18 19 if you're in a full ppr league A dude ran every single route. He was targeted over 38% of the time in this game. Five times on 14 Mahomes passes. Rashi Rice is still available at the 4-5 turn in pretty much every single fantasy draft you do. And on platforms like Sleeper, ESPN, Yahoo, he's going like 6th, 7th round right now because of the looming suspension that it doesn't look like it's coming this year. So Rashi Rice is an absolute bust draft player right now. Over the second half of last year, I'll put these stats up on the screen. Rashi Rice outperformed Travis Kelsey to a major degree. The dude didn't play more than 60% of the snaps until week eight, and then he became a full-time player. So you look at his games from week eight to the end of the season, dude was averaging 16 and a half PPR fantasy points per game. If you look at their bye week 10 and forward, that's when he was really implemented as a full-time player, 80 plus percent of the snaps. The dude was averaging over 18 full PPR fantasy points per game. He literally, I'm not saying this hyperbolically, became the number one target for Patrick Mahomes in this offense, and you should draft him accordingly. Same thing with Isaiah Pacheco, who played on the first drive, and then they just iced him, right? Even when they got into the red zone, third and eight, which is great. You want to see third and long. You want to see obvious passing situations that Pacheco stays in. He takes over that McKinnon role. He did so. They had that first drive, and then they put him onto the bench and let Carson Steele come out here and play a lot of first string snapped while Clyde Edwards Hilaire was out. So Pacheco is right where we've predicted him all offseason. Rashi Rice is a big mover. And listen, I'm not uh, Xavier Worthy. If you look at our draft guide, he's not on the all fade list. I don't want him in dynasty. I don't necessarily believe in him as a player. And I don't think he's going to have the season that people are predicting him to once Hollywood Brown returns. But he's not someone that I can't draft based on. I mean, he's hit the nut fucking draw at this point, right? First round to the Chiefs. Hollywood Brown now hurt. Like everything is going his way. So if he doesn't perform well, that is 
a massive red flag for his dynasty outlook. But right now, he looks good. He's obviously fast as fuck, boy, and he's in Andy Reid's offense. So there's a lot that can go right. I will just say don't overemphasize what's going to happen in this offense. He's a lid lifter that opens up the middle of the field for their best receivers in Rashi Rice and Travis Kelsey. Now that we're in week two, you have a ton of teams that just rested all of their starters, and we'll just list them quickly. Ravens, Falcons, Lions, Seahawks, Titans, Colts, Jets, Panthers, the Cowboys, the Jaguars, the Packers, and the 49ers, except for Brock Purdy. That was weird. So we had a lot of teams rest their starters and didn't get much of uh, any sort of information from those teams. A lot of the information that we got last week was kind of confirmed when we look at the Bears receiving trio, when we look at the Texans receiving trio, where for the Bears, DJ Moore took the most snaps. Keenan Allen was right behind him. Roma Dunze was right behind him. Caleb Williams, again, made some incredible throws that just continues to make me more and more confident as someone I'm drafting easily as you know a top 15 quarterback in fantasy this year. I'm also starting to get more and more on board. Like If we look at Roma Dunze and Jackson Smith and Jigba, they're going to get a lot of comps based on being a the third wide receiver, being a highly drafted first round wide receiver in a crowded receiving room. I'm Rome over JSN a thousand times out of a thousand in drafts at this point. I think that Rome is a much better receiver overall. I think that Caleb Williams is much better than Geno Smith. And I think that there's a really good chance. I don't know the vibes out of out of camp for Keenan Allen with his weight gain and all this stuff don't feel great right now. OK, so I'm, I'm, I'm slowly inching towards making Rome a, a real significant part of my target list in the 6th, 7th, 8th round of fantasy drafts, predicting a second half of the year absolute breakout. And with the Texans, we had more of the same where Nico Collins took 15 of the 17 snaps, CJ Stroud, Stefan Diggs took 12 of 17, and then Tank Dell took 10 of 17. And this is kind of one of the problems where when Tank Dell is third in receiver snaps, it should be an issue. Last week, we like to overlook that because he caught a touchdown, right? And that's a part of football. Like explosive players make explosive plays. But again, when we continue to see the same things happening over and over again, the coaches aren't doing this for fun. They are trying to look at what their actual first string offense looks like and what they want it to be when the regular season comes around. So this is now back-to-back -back weeks in which Tank Dell is playing the wide receiver three role. Can he overtake Stefan Diggs like I'm predicting Rome to do for Keenan Allen? Of course, but it's just something to be weary of, again, because Tank and Steph go very, very close in drafts. In that same game, on the other side of the ball, we got to see a lot of Daniel Jones. He played 33 snaps in this one, looked horrendous against the Texans starters, which ultimately forced Malik Neighbors to play horrendously against the starters. Overall, Malik Neighbors looked... He, he looks legendary out on the field. However, Daniel Jones against the Texans starting defense and not even the full starters, just some of the starters. He went two for six, 18 passing yards and two interceptions. Once the backups came in, then he heated up for 120 passing yards, nine of 12. Like, and that's when Malik neighbors started to dominate. But you're playing against third string defensive backs. And of course, like the starting quarterback that just got paid one hundred fifty million dollars better fucking play that way against third stringers in the NFL. So Malik Neighbors, sure, it's great to see him get a lot of targets. It's great to see him make a lot of those catches. But again, like when you are drafting, man, the easiest way to just have a good fantasy team is draft players on good teams. You want teams that are going to be on the field a lot. You want teams that are going to, going to be putting up points that give you scoring opportunities that are not turning the ball over all the time. So like we just need we need to we need to we need to come back down to reality, knowing that like Daniel Jones is who Daniel Jones is. And you don't want one of your top, like right now in underdog, I see Malik Neighbors going off the board at like the 25th, 26th overall pick. You want your early third round pick to be attached to Daniel Jones. No, you do not. Let's move from the NFC East to the AFC East. And we'll start with the Dolphins where Tua played, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell did not. But Tua played two drives, 11 snaps out of Tua. And <laughs> the first thing you notice when you're watching this game is I think the Dolphins might legitimately use that cheat motion on 100% of their snaps this year. Like, go rewatch that game. If you got NFL Game Pass or whatever, you could rewatch the condensed version of these preseason games. Every single play, they got a man in motion, and it works to perfection. I think this offense is going to be even better this year than they were last year, which is a very fucking high bar, and it just makes me more... Tua look on point. Tua look sharp as shit. Makes me more and more confident that Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle are great picks where they're going in drafts. As for the running back room, I will say, if you've been 
drafting Devon Achan as early as his ADP suggests, right? Like on the four for four ADP resource that I share with you guys, which is industry wide ADP, he's the 211 right now. Raheem Mostert played nine of 11 of the snaps with Tua, including the short yardage situations and those types of things. Now, that's not going to be the split. He's not going to be playing 85% of the snaps, of course, but I still think a lot of Devon Achan's ADP is the fact that we are just assuming that he was so good as a rookie that he will take a major jump up in opportunity share as a sophomore. And a major jump up would be maybe going from like 39 or 41 percent of the touches to 59 or 62 percent of the touches. I don't know that I would be so fast to make that move yet, especially the way that this preseason has shooken out. And after Tua came off the field, Devon Achan remained on the field. And for a dude that has injury concerns or a dude that's 190 pounds, you would think that if if Mike McDaniel like was super enamored with this guy or like really expected him to be a massive part of the game plan, I don't even want to go that far because that's actually ridiculous. I do expect him to be a, a major part of the game plan, but it's just weird that he continued to play after Tua was out and he's a dude that like you don't really want taking hits. So I think there's a possibility. I think we need to leave room for the fact that like Mike McDaniel, while he knows how special HN is, uh, sees him as still a complimentary player to Mostert that provides just a lot of juice in this offense and that he doesn't make that jump from 11 touches per game up to 15 touches per game where we need him to be. If he's gonna, He needs to put up legendary efficiency once again, and he could do that because he's a legendary trait type player. But like, do you want to bank on that? I'm having a hard time justifying the 211 ADP. I'll just say that. Staying in the AFC East, for the Buffalo Bills, we did not have Josh Allen suit up in this one, but we did have every single other starter with Mitch Trubisky. So we're going to work off of that. And Trubisky got 15 snaps. Now, James Cook, for the second week in a row, stayed on the field for 100% of the snaps with the starters. Six carries. He ran routes on the other nine plays. And he was open on like every route he ran, but Trubisky stinks. I think we might be underestimating just how much utilization James Cook is going to get in this new look Bills offense under Joe Brady and what we saw the second half of last year might have just been the beginning. And I know for a fact what you guys are underutilizing is leaguesafe.com. All right. If you have a if you have a league with your friends, family, coworkers, whatever, collecting money as a commissioner is a fucking nightmare. If you start your league on League Safe, all you have to do is literally start the league and drop a link into the group chat and people pay through there. You don't have to worry about PayPal. You don't have to worry about Venmo. You don't have to worry about collecting cash. You don't have to worry about these 19 different payment methods because none of the actual platforms you play on, ESPN, Yahoo, whatever, allow you to collect buy-ins from the league members. League Safe is specifically made for this reason. And if you're a first-time commissioner on League Safe, you're going to get $50 back on your buy-in if you use the link below with our code BDGE. So literally, if you have a $50 buy-in league with your coworkers, and you sign up for the first time to be a commissioner on League Safe, you're getting your buy-in free for this league. Just drop the link to your group chat, have them join. They won't even know that you got the $50 off, but I'm hooking you up, all right? So leaguesafe.com, create your league on there. It is the single best platform for buy-ins for a fantasy football league. This is the beautiful part of the internet. This is the beautiful part of of having this online connection is there are businesses and services and niches for everything. This is a problem and it was a problem that was solved by League Safe. Literally just a platform for you to pay your league buy-ins. LeagueSafe.com. Use the link below to get $50 off your buy-in if you are a first-time commissioner on League Safe. It is mwah. It is beautiful, as is James Cook utilization, as is Keon Coleman's utilization. For the second week in a row, he has played on 100% of the snaps with the starters. Now, it hasn't amount, amounted to much production, but again, in the preseason, we are looking at utilization, not production. Last week, people were kind of overlooking this because they're like, oh, you know what? There was no like big X receivers that were healthy for the game like Matt Collins, so that's why Keon played all the, all the snaps. Matt Collins played this week, and Keon still played 15 of the 15 snaps. The other guys mixed in. Matt Collins had 13 of the 15. Cleo Shakir took 11 of the 15. And then you had MVS who played two of the 15. All right. So Keon Coleman is getting an insane amount of run with the starters. And it looks like he is going to be a near full-time player right off the rip. So if you believe in him as a talent, this should be music to your ears right now. I think the last big takeaway, we didn't have a lot of injuries this week, which is crazy. Normally, you know, you got 32 teams playing. We come away from those types of weekends with like 10 fantasy relevant injuries and the worst of them, uh, which is 
really unfortunate because Jalen Warren is kind of like a fantasy darling. He strained his hamstring, and reports came out last night that he is week to week, and he is uncertain for week one. So typically when these types of hamstring injuries occur late August, they are stay aways for me. So Warren has moved significantly down in my rankings. He was, I think, like the RB24 25 in full PPR and has now moved all the way down to uh, like the RB 33 to 35 in that range because of the likelihood of this lingering or him pushing himself too fast early on in the season and then just missing another like four weeks because of this. We see this happen all the time. So I am completely off of Jalen Warren at his current price of where you need to draft him. And it kind of just pushes towards the, the Najee propaganda that I've been pushing all summer. I will say that the Steelers offense looked horrendous. Broderick Jones might be the woke pass blocking tackle. But yeah, if Jalen Warren misses time, this is a an offense that gets even more condensed than it already was. Garner Minshew has won the starting job in Las Vegas. That's kind of what I assumed was going to happen anyways. Uh, nothing really big to take out from that game. Lastly, we can go to New Orleans. Alvin Kamara, Rashid Shahid, and Jawan Johnson did not play, but Derek Carr took 22 snaps. And what I will say is Jamal Williams and Taysom Hill are both underdrafted right now in best ball. Jamal Williams is like a 17th, 18th round pick, but he is very clearly going to get a lot of work in this offense and probably vulture some goal line carries. So will Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill is is like Clint Kubiak came over and their offense is kind of similar to the 49ers offense. Taysom Hill is kind of playing like the Kyle Juszczyk role here, and he was getting carries straight up from the backfield. He got five carries in this one. One was a fullback carry from the goal line, which he scored a touchdown. So now Kamara has two dudes that are vulturing goal line carries from him. I don't know what his touchdown line currently is. I Last I checked on underdog, it was four and a half for the season. But if I had a gun to my head, I would take the lower on four and a half rushing touchdowns for Kamara over the season. And Taysom Hill, if he is a tight end designation on the platform that you are using, he is getting dangerously close to getting put on our must draft list in our draft guide right now. Okay, And if you want to see all those players, the must draft list, our complete all fade list, our rankings, PPR standard, half PPR, super flex, one quarterback, all of our in-depth team by team, game by game recaps throughout the entire preseason. The draft guide, the draft guide, the draft guide, best product out in fantasy right now, bdge.co for full price or for the most discounted price, underdogfantasy.com or just download the app. It's much smoother. Use promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more for the first time. You're going to get a free square of half a passing yard for Lamar in week one. You're going to get a deposit bonus up to $250, depending on how much you deposit. But all you need to do is throw down $10 on the app to get the draft guide email to you. Access absolutely free in real time. Everything updated throughout the rest of the summer. That's it for today. I'll be back tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe. I love you. Smoochies. Smoochies.